the talk show. Right now, it's time for the annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture. As a uh, great host was saying, there was a bit of uh, uncertainty earlier on disruptions, but it went off without a hitch. The Rector and Vice Chancellor, Professor Brian O'Connell, and the Desmond and Leah Tutu Legacy Foundation hosted the second annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture. The lecture uh, is being delivered by Mrs. Grasa Michelle, and she's addressing the topic Women, Democracy, and Freedom. Is it scaling the highest? peaks of political and economic power or safety at home and in our communities that is the true measure of a society's liberation here is the keynote speaker at the annual desmond dudu international peace lecture mrs grassa Marshall. we are so thankful for your loving and caring of the father of our nation in the way that all of us were longing for And so, ladies and gentlemen, I give you this extraordinary woman, Grasha Mashel. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you. My dear sister Leah, the entire Tutu family, the board members of the Desmond and Leah Tutu family legacy foundation, Professor Ramesh Baruthnam, executive members, academics, SRC staff, students, and members of the UWC Convocation, ministers, deputy ministers, representatives of the diplomatic missions, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. As you always manage to make me feel very small. I must say that if today I married my debate, <laughs> you remember Arch? <laughs> the two of us were being Madiba and I were being a bit naughty, if I can say. We were staying together, and uh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and Aji called me and said, "No, you have to get married." We tried, both of us. We tried to resist. Simply because we have uh, very complex family situations here in the, my own family in Mozambique and Madiba's family here. So we are a bit hesitant whether we should uh, really get married. But it, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but actually, is uh, one of those people who, whenever he picks up our, our a phone and call you, you just can't say no. Whatever he says, you end up saying yes. <laughs> Thank you, my leader, for giving me this uh, opportunity to deliver, not really a lecture. This is not a lecture as a conventional lecture you are used to a philosophical or academic dissertation. My address tonight is simply a conversation, which I hope it is going to trigger some reflections on the theme which was given to us, which is 
women, democracy, and freedom. I'm going to focus strictly on South Africa because I think at this stage we need to revisit the journey we have traveled since uh, 1994 when it comes to democratic institutions, democratic processes, and democratic practices. To look at how women are forging or have been forging these institutions and processes, and how practices are conducive to women to benefit and enjoy their rights. Let me go back to 1956, when we had that Women's March. That was a turning point in the history of the struggle in this country. Women standing and affirming, asserting their dignity as full and responsible citizens, women showed they were able to change the rules of the game. They were at the forefront. They were above race, above class. They were women. They were citizens. I think we need to fix that image of women of all structures marching together just to claim their dignity. In 1994, women gained the hard-won right to vote. For many young people, voting is something which is a given. It's a routine. But voting is something which has claimed hundreds and thousands and millions of lives in the world just to have the right to choose the government which will rule our lives. Gaining that seat and that voice in parliament is seen many times as a normal practice, but it carries those hopes and dreams of millions of our daughters and sons in this soil who fought and suffered for the right to vote and to be in parliament and to devise and to shape what our nation is to look like. Let me refer here also to the women's coalition. We saw women from across political affiliations, across race, across racial structure, urban and rural women, to entrench women's rights into the Bill of Rights of our widely acclaimed constitution. Women did not sit aside and say the movement of shaping this, the constitution can be done by only by all of us. They wanted to make a stand and to make sure that uh, that beautiful constitution has a very clear and strong mark of women's aspirations and dreams. Our constitution, I'm not going to talk about it because it has been many times referred as uh, the, if not one of the best or the best constitution on the world. We have legislation, particularly the first sitting of parliament has opened the space and the landscape where all of us would walk to make our own footprint in that June journey of building democracy. Ever since, women have been the majority of voters. In, 19, in 2009, the Independent Electoral Commission says that women were 57% of voters. Currently, 42% of parliamentarians are women. South Africa ranks 
as the seventh in the world as the highest representation of women in parliament. And South Africa is the third in Africa just after Rwanda and Seychelles. We have some of the beautiful legislations to protect women against violence, women to have women enjoy their reproductive rights. We have, for instance, the Maintenance Act and the recognition of customary marriage. All this, just as examples, are extraordinary successes which open space for women to become agents of change while they develop a new social consciousness to free themselves individually and collectively from oppression and exclusion. But let's recognize that we have this represent high representation due to a system of quota. Let's imagine if we didn't have the quota, what would be the representation of women there? That's to say there is a journey between the strong command of the state, which goes across the political, the economic, and the judiciary systems to bring women to the center of the decision making, and what is the consciousness of women themselves when they took those positions there, and how society changes with it, and it does now allow women to enjoy fully their rights. Let's recognize that numbers are important, but not enough. We need a voice which is strong enough to articulate the aspirations and priorities and needs, specific needs of women to the center of national agenda. But in fact, if we can remember, consultation and activism on women's rights is fading away. Women's voice today is fragmented in different interest groups. Women in rural areas in our townships are not heard in the national discourse. Women's organizations affiliated to political parties have become more partisan than women's representatives of the interests from interests of women from all folks of life. The connection between the elected and the majority of women is weak, and in some times, in some cases, it's not it's even inexistent. That is to say, yes we have made progress, but we still have to make sure that in every instance of our national agenda and the national discourse, the voices of women as they are, are part of shaping policy, strategies, implementation ways and plans of how we move together and not only to make up the numbers which make us, of course, very proud. In the economic sphere, there have been much said about economic women's empowerment. Public and private institutions have designed strategies aimed at accelerating the assets of women so that they will have financial resources, they will have training, information, networking, they will do business in a way they can compete nationally and internationally. We see annual events which are held to celebrate success and publicize existing opportunities. But South Africa, as any African country still runs two parallel economies. The formal economy and the so-called informal economy. The formal 
is big. Actually, South Africa is considered to be the biggest economy on the continent. But it involves a relatively smaller number of people who concentrate much of national resources and wealth. The informal economy is big in numbers, but it holds very little of the resources we generate. And the face of the informal sector is, of course, that of a woman. In other words, it means the majority of women in our country do not still benefit for the huge amount of wealth this country is generating. What we say is poverty, unemployment, inequality, look around the face of a woman personifies all that. Women represent 48% of the workforce in this country. But in many instances, the principle of equal, equal work and equal pay doesn't apply to them. Again, here we, have, we are confronted with gross implementation gaps where democratic principles are ignored in processes and practices. And we will all know, as I mentioned, that unemployment, poverty, and equality hit the hardest on women, and especially African women. But let me say that we know the realities. We actually are trying to have some strategies, although they are far from being effective. We can say that we have some sort of a vision in the making. But it is in the social sphere where I want our conversation tonight to focus on. I dare to say that South Africa has not even begun to understand the deepest social crisis which has been structured, engineered, crafted, and systematically implemented along decades and decades by the apartheid system, precisely to break the social fabric of this nation so as to oppress and control the majority of the people. I don't believe that in 18 years of freedom, this nation took the time to seriously revisit what kind of psychological and emotional damage has been inflicted on men and women in this society. Let's remember, families have been torn apart for at least three generations. A significant number of parents in their 40s and 50s today, they grew up in torn, disrupted, and dysfunctional families. They carry with them the emotional mutilations. They are trying hard to mold their children around a concept of a family which they didn't have, they didn't enjoy. It may sound presumptuous, but I have observed as a South African, and also as Mozambican, that we in this country, we have a huge difficulties in communicating in a smooth, peaceful, and accommodating manner. We hold a lot of anger, a lot of aggressiveness in communication. Our societal 
interactions are in many cases that of accusing one another, blaming one another. It is almost as if it's the responsibility of somebody else within our society, all the ills we face. I sincerely think we are in pain. We are hurting. We are bleeding. We are harming one another because we cannot control our pain. I'm not talking of the strikes. I'm talking of society in normal relations. Those who go as far as raping women, children, and the elderly are an expression of self-hate. They hate themselves so deep that they feel the need to inflict, and sometimes in a very sophisticated way, to inflict pain and hurt to others. And of course, in that, they become hollow of their own sense of humanity. And they are trying to destroy humanity in the victims. I think we need a vision of how to build a healthy society, how to heal the character of the sons and daughters of this beautiful nation. This vision should help us to get ourselves free from anger, free from fear, free from accumulated frustrations which inhibit us or make us unable to touch others in a loving manner. The issue of gender violence and violence against children in this country is treated in many cases as 16 days of activism against gender violence. Focusing and focusing on police, courts, and sentences. How many people have been arrested? How many people have been tried? And how many cases have been sentences? That is important. It's needed, but that's not the basic issue. The issue is why are we having hundreds and thousands of cases where we hurt one another, we humiliate one another, and we try to dehumanize one another. And that's the issue That's the issue which I don't think we have taken the trouble to think of. In a recent study on households in Johannesburg, we were told that 61% of fathers have never paid maintenance to the children. The other studies tell us that 40% of African households are headed by women, and not because the husbands or the fathers of these families are dead, 
but they are, they are alive, they are somewhere else. The South African family structure has changed dramatically in recent decades due to the matters I have uh, referred to just now, but also due to the impact of HIV AIDS, due also to migration from rural to urban areas. Just look at our, how our townships and shacks are growing daily. Due to migrant labor, which the situation of the miners now has brought very glary to our eyes where and how those men are living and where are their families. I'm in the Eastern Cape now and we sat there receiving the corpse coming when Marikana took place. The South African family structure has changed also due to an increasing number of uh, young women, actually adolescents, who are becoming mothers. So children bearing children. We seem to continue to think of a family unit in its traditional form without taking into account all these changes. But that is part of reality. It is true that we still have family units in traditional form. It's just part of it. The other reality is that there are new formations of family units we don't understand. We can't cater for, we can't support, and we can protect. Being the family unit, the building block of a stable, cohesive, loving, and caring society, we have to accept the huge part of our family unit is in a huge strain. And in no state, no social formations, no even researchers do understand the extent of that strain in those families. Generations after generations are coming in those circumstances. So let me say we cannot expect women to enjoy freedom and to enjoy democratic practices, for women to be free from want, free from fear, to be free to make conscious choices in life and to enjoy all the freedoms inherent to human dignity in these circumstances. I want to submit that it's not about women alone. It's about society. More importantly, it's about the family unit. Without turning back the family unit to become the nurturing hub, the nurturing nest where men, women, and children form a cohesive and loving cell of society, women will not be safe women will continue to be brutalized. Even more, men will continue to brutalize themselves when they brutalize women and children. I 
think we need to to take a serious look of what is the meaning of parenting in the circumstances of the family I just described. We probably need to develop systems and processes in which parenting skills for mothers who have to bring up their children alone, or fathers who have to do that alone, or even for young women who have to become mothers, for grandmothers who are mothers, what is the meaning of parenting in those circumstances when it comes to millions of a family units? And what it means for stability and cohesion of our society. I dare to say that our society today is similar to this picture I'm going to sketch for you. We have been brilliant architects of a beautiful building. We had dreamed of and we had imagined it and we sketched that building. The roof is solid, colorful, actually it's perfect. But the walls are cracking. The cracks are so deep and wide that you can see from inside what's inside going on, outside out. what's going on inside. And that is the economic setup, which are the walls. The foundations, which is society itself, has very, very solid and strong pillars, but they are disconnected because the social fabric is fractured. This is our building. Who is going to fix it? And how are we going to fix it? As I said at the beginning, it, the architect, architecture is perfect. But we need to fix the building itself from the foundations and from the walls. I want to challenge the research institutions to join hands and to use science, because this is not only about social mobilization. It requires a deep and clear understanding. So I'm asking them to produce a comprehensive picture of what our society has become in recent times. We need to have a comprehensive and coherent understanding of what has happened to our feelings, to our emotions, to our social relations, to the way we communicate with one another, to be able then to put this social fabric together. Arch, you led us to confront our demons with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It sounded like it would have been an impossible job. But perpetrators and victims were able to look into the eyes of each other, of one another. They faced the truth, painful as it was, and they ended up accepting one another, accepting the past, and to join hands and say, yes, let's build the present and the future together. I think we need something like that. 
that as a movement, not only as a group of people who have happened to have perpetrated some atrocities, as I said at the beginning, we need to do this with the consciousness that as a society we are in pain, we are hurting, and we are bleeding. So maybe I'll suggest that uh, religious institutions, all kind of social formations, traditional institutions, women's groups, men's groups, youth, we begin to think together. And uh, information which would have been provided to us by those who can research. And we build a movement to take responsibility for leaking our wounds, healing them, and face the future, a bright future for all of us. I'd like to make this appeal directly to our universities and beginning at this University of Western Cape, which by the way is also my university. <laughs> you, have, uh, you have a proud tradition of challenging the inequalities in our society and throwing the spotlights of what needs to be fixed. You have also a well-established and growing research reputation. Many other academic institutions in this country have the same capacity. Virtually every problem we have can be scrutinized under the lens of research. And then, as we have a national plan for the next 30 years, let's make of our building I spoke of. How do we build it in 30 years? And 30 years, it means a generation. How do we build it in a way we are to become a healthy, strong, cohesive, loving, protecting society in which our families will thrive as the building blocks of that society. Arch, I chose not to speak of this problem as a women's problem. But I know that women are the rock. I want to present women tonight as agents of, cha of change with the strengths and resilience they have, not as victims as many times are being protected. If they can bring up their children alone, it's because they have resourcefulness and they have the capacity to go beyond themselves and to embrace and love. Women will have to join this. And why not? Even to lead the way, in the way they educate their children, men, and women, boys and girls, to know how to accept one another, to protect one another, to love one another, and to make of our societies and our family happy ones. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. And good night.
That was Mrs. Grassa Michelle presenting the annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture at the University of the Western Cape, UWC. And uh, you heard the Arch himself, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, introducing Madam Grassa Michelle. A uh, very funny note that she started on, actually, um, remembering back to the days when um, she and Tadama Diba were courting. And I'm going to call it courting, although she came straight out and said it was a fat and sit situation. They were living together. <laughs> fat and sit and uh, the arch called them to order and said no you cannot you cannot do this and that is the beauty I guess of having elders of having um, you know that, that peer system where you can call each other to order where you can call make each other accountable as uh, the brothers for life slogan says Yenza Gahle and clearly Mam Krasa Michelle and Tata Madiba then did Gahle and they did well and uh, got married but uh, the theme of her talk topic tonight was women, democracy and freedom. Is it scaling the highest peaks of political and economic power or safety at home and in community? That is the true measure of a society's liberation focused um, on women and the family and uh, spoke about the impact and challenges women are facing in the workplace and in the home. She also spoke about the need to build a healthy society that will build the character of the sons and daughters of the soil as we are a society in pain and this is manifesting in how we relate to each other and the violence that is perpetrated on women, children and the elderly. Talking about a society in pain, it made me think of Ben Okri's lecture when he spoke about healing through dreams and uh, Madame Grasa Michelle issued a challenge to research institutions um, in terms of how we can go about this healing uh, how to build our society in the next 30 years as she said, 30 years is a generation. So um, an acknowledgement of the uh, healing that needs to be done, not only in South Africa, but on the continent as a whole. She also spoke about uh, gender violence and uh, there not being enough focus on gender violence. Uh, 16 days of activism that is devoted to looking at stats, etc. And that is not the issue. She says the issue is why are these crimes taking place? Why do we go out of our way as men and women to degrade each other, to humiliate each other, to dehumanize each other? That was a heartfelt plea that really resonated with me. Uh, I don't know about you. Um, uh, Also touched on the uh, absent fathers and women-headed household phenomenon and how this impacts on the family structure. Of course, acknowledging that there are various challenges that the family faces and the ongoing migrant labor system is one of these challenges. Use Margana as an example and the many, many men and women um, now who are uh, Uh, working on the mines far from their families. Uh, The family unit, she said, is the building block of a healthy society and uh, no understanding of, there's no understanding of the strain or pressure on the family um, and this condemns generations to such conditions. So what we're looking at is our children and our children's children operating and living under the same conditions, under the same circumstances, dealing with the same challenges because there is actually no effort to try and understand the strains and pressures on the family, which is a building block of a healthy society and acknowledging that we don't have this uh, uh, a healthy society and that is why we have such a dysfunctional society because the family unit is under stress and therefore the call to uh, research institutions or the challenge to research institutions and uh, the need to to have the family unit as a nurturing cell for men and women and children and she spoke about how until this happens until the family unit is a nurturing cell um, you know, uh, men will continue to brutalize women, children and themselves because in brutalizing their better halves, in brutalizing their offspring, they themselves are also uh, in the process being brutalized. And, and that is unfortunately what a lot of men know. And uh, that's some of the programs that we have and features that we have on the talk shop itself. Things like our mentors network that recognizes that men need as much support as women do. Men need 
these structures, these platforms, these outlets, where they can also talk about the challenges that they face, emotional challenges, the psychological challenges that they don't or are not encouraged to speak about. So this was truly a talk from a woman, a mother talking to uh, other women, talking to other mothers, but also talking to husbands, talking to partners, talking to grandparents. Um, and uh, uh, looking at uh, the defining of parent, what is parenting, she says, especially when we look at the single parent household phenomenon where grandmothers are parents, where children are parenting other children. Truly a holistic look is needed at these challenges that family, that women, that children, that our society faces, our society that is in pain, our society that is in need of healing. Thank you so much, Mama Grasa Mashal. That was absolutely inspiring and really, really wonderful to hear an annual lecture that goes down to the grassroots level and talks to us as people, that talks to us as one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, it, it, it was almost as though she was sitting across from, from me and talking to me as a woman about these challenges, about these these problems that we face. That was the annual Desmond Tutu International Peace Lecture delivered by Mam Grasa Machel. Mam Grasa Machel. Mam Grasa Machel. Mam Grasa Machel. Mam Grasa Machel.